Death Stranding. is a game that was released in 2019 by the iconic Hideo Kojima, who has carved out a name for himself in the industry for his unmatched ability to craft singular, memorable experiences that would go on to progress the medium of video games in several important ways. What took you so long? Say what you want about Kojima, but he has never been one you could criticize for lack of ambition. And although it's entirely subjective as to what extent of an impression Kojima's innovations have had on the industry as a whole, he has always been a creator I found myself captivated by, in fervently following his works to see what he would present us with next. His efforts to progress the industry once more with Death Stranding, what he would come to refer to as the first strand-type game, given its unique approach to the gameplay loop revolving around the theme of connectivity and unity, as opposed to destruction and disconnect, sadly fell largely on deafened ears back at release. If you look at the reviews now, they seem overall quite positive, and I'd like to think the overall perception of the game's quality has improved over time, but at release, Death Stranding was THE game to make fun of and exacerbate its flaws. And I'm not here to argue that the opinion of anyone who hated or still hates this game is invalid or say that Death Stranding is some misunderstood masterpiece undeserving of any criticism. Death Stranding is an often goofy and bizarre experience, both intentionally and unintentionally, which can encourage wildly polarizing opinions depending on your level of investment into this type of game that is supposedly the first of its kind. The main criticisms I see leveled against the game are that it has a frustrating and often tedious gameplay loop and that it feels very Kojima, as some have put it. This latter point is a fairly interesting one to me because it's one that seems to have only come about in recent years following the establishment of Kojima as a visionary, as some would say. And with the rise of any visionary comes the counterpoint that a visionary is inherently pretentious or self-serving. Yes, it's true that this is likely the most Kojima game Kojima has made to date. And by that I mean it introduces concepts and visual oddities in such rapid succession with little to no context that it simply isn't possible to decipher for the meaning of it all in moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, unless you are Kojima. However, the question that ought to accompany this criticism is whether you are capable of separating the art from the artist here. Do people jump to dismiss the clear level of ambition on display here simply because it is a Kojima game that carries with it certain implications of his alleged hubris and pretentiousness? Or is it because the game itself reaches beyond its grasp? That isn't a question I can answer for you, but I do hope by the end of the video that the points I'm making may help determine whether you feel Death Stranding is truly a game that is frustratingly incomprehensible or inaccessible to those without any prior inclination toward Kojima as a creator. As for Death Stranding's frustrating and tedious gameplay loop, yes. Being of the opinion that this game isn't worth playing because of the core gameplay loop is an entirely valid point. Even though I myself find it often rewarding and even therapeutic to explore the vast open world of Death Stranding and form these connections between different parts of the United States, there is no denying some level of technical jank in the gameplay itself, alongside what I find to be the single greatest flaw that the game presents. And that, I feel, hits at the core of why so many turned their backs on this game not long after starting it. Death Stranding's biggest issue is its fatal lack of connectivity between the gameplay and narrative progression and its distinct lack of player involvement in that narrative. Games like The Last of Us, Detroit Become Human, and many others fall into this pedigree of games that strive for a more cinematic tone and attempt to tell a compelling story through a compelling world and compelling characters while the gameplay is merely an accessory to it. Death Stranding's downfall, however, comes by way of the fact that so little of the actual gameplay, as in the aspects of the game where you have physical control over what's happening, provide anything in terms of narrative progression or change. It's clear that Kojima's interests more heavily lie in world building and the story and characters on a grand scale as told through cutscenes. But so little of what you're actually doing as the player manages to maintain any semblance of narrative investment. It breaks down to feeling as though you are just running from cutscene to cutscene, and whether you are enjoying the gameplay that occurs between these cutscenes is irrelevant in the context of the fact that if you were to sit down and watch a supercut of all the cinematic cutscenes in this game, which 
total at well over 10 hours, mind you, you would be able to pick up on nearly every major narrative element of the game without having actually played or watched gameplay of a single minute of it. Yes, there's some minor context clues and bits of lore that are told through messages relayed to you over the comm system and in logs you collect while you play. However, much of this then just gets reiterated later on in cutscenes that sometimes just regurgitate information already known to the player. President Strand believed in American reconstructionism. She worked tirelessly to bring the nation together again. And without her, there would be no bridges. President Bridget Strand was the symbol of American reconstructionism. People held on to their hope that America would rise again because they believed in her. Nico, it's Roman. Let's go bowling. As I mentioned, Kojima's focus appears to be on Death Stranding's characters, story, and world, which are arguably its greatest qualities, and form the majority of the reason behind why I decided to even make this video. So by extension, those are the elements of the game that I am most invested in as well. That I enjoy the gameplay loop that occurs in between these cutscenes is simply icing on the cake, but this won't be the case for all players. And my primary motivation in continuing to play was, at times, just to unlock these cutscenes that would further unravel the mystery box puzzles of the game's mind-bending narrative, and oftentimes the gameplay itself felt more more like an obligatory roadblock toward doing so, rather than a complementary means of storytelling. In terms of the gameplay, there are no decisions for the player to make or any real means of player agency. It's just, do these things so that you can progress the story. And between these rather uninvesting segments of the game early on, paired with a prologue and pair of opening chapters that span well over four hours, where the majority of it is spent watching cutscenes before you can even enter the open world in its entirety, you carry an inherently large risk of alienating your player base right from the get-go. Now, of course, these cutscenes are something to behold in being beautifully animated and well-acted, so this certainly isn't a knock against the quality of these cutscenes or the technical prowess on display here. But those looking for an engaging gameplay experience may find themselves disappointed by a lack of purpose or progression in participating in said gameplay. And those interested in pursuing the story may find themselves frustrated by how little truly investing gameplay there is between points of narrative progression through cutscenes. What you end up with is a lack of cohesion between gameplay and narrative that proves difficult for the player to want to fully invest themselves in at all times. Now I know I just spent the last few minutes ragging on this game and the purpose of this video is to try to convey why it deserves a second chance, but the entire point of making this video isn't to classify Death Stranding as a good or bad game or to shower it with an endless supply of blind affection. Rather, the point of making this video is to examine the reasons why many people, including myself, still love Death Stranding and find it to be one of the most satisfying experiences ever conceived in a video game, despite its shortcomings, in the hopes that that I might be able to convince you to still give this game a first or second chance by the end. I acknowledge the misgivings that many have had with Death Stranding since release, but I still think there's more than enough here for it to rise above its weaker elements. Death Stranding recently released its definitive director's cut on PC, and there's also rumors coming around about a sequel being in the works, and so in celebration of that I wanted to release this video in the hopes that I might be able to resurrect some interest in a game that I feel has become criminally underrated and overlooked since its initial release. So basically the structure of the video will be of me walking you through all the major gameplay mechanics and story beats of the game as they occur or are introduced, offering brief interjections of commentary, criticism, clarity, praise, and rather unfunny humor to hopefully keep you engaged. There will be a point of no return later in the video where I will be getting into major spoilers from that point on, but for now you can rest assured that I won't be spoiling any major aspect of the game or its story until that point, just in case you haven't played the game yet and are in need of some convincing here. At the end, when all is said and done, I hope to have had a hand in convincing skeptics to give Death Stranding a try or otherwise shed some light on aspects of the narrative that may have been confusing to those of you who have already finished the game, because there's just so much here 
harder to unpack. So I hope this can serve as a worthwhile experience both for those who have played the game and enjoyed as much as I do, and also for those who are on the fence about it or tried it once but couldn't get into it. I know this is an exceptionally long video, but the goal is to have anyone on the fence convinced to give the game another shot or a first shot by the time that point of no return and major spoilers comes. And there are timestamps in the description if you want to jump around a bit. In its director's cut, Death Stranding is a more rewarding experience now than it ever was. And by the end of this video, I hope I'm able to play some role, no matter how small, in changing some of the otherwise dismissive or derivative discussion around this game and prove to you why Death Stranding deserves a second chance. And so, getting into things right off the bat, we're treated to a gorgeous opening cutscene set to a great song by the musical group Low Roar, which is the group that makes up the majority of the non-original soundtrack in this game. Sadly, this cutscene and all the cutscenes in this video aren't going to be as gorgeous as they would be if you were playing the game, because I captured all of this game in 1080p instead of 1440p because I just don't have space to be capturing 100 hours of a game in 1440p. And especially not for a game that can be as graphically demanding as this one is at max settings. And so everything here in the opening cutscene sets the tone perfectly, providing us a nice taste of what's to come, with many events occurring in rapid succession that introduce us to the world and gameplay of Death Stranding. There is certainly a lot presented to the player here in this opening cutscene, with very minor details being relayed in its approach that really only makes sense in retrospect. All I know is that whatever is going on, I'm already on board. Why are these birds shiveling up from rainfall? What is our protagonist running from? Who is this person he just murdered with his bike just now? And notice that seamless transition from cutscene to gameplay. All of the cutscenes are rendered in-engine in real time, which means no pre-rendered cutscenes taking you out of the experience or lessening your sense of immersion. The game looks equally stunning between the moments you can and can't play through yourself, and it's almost unbelievable how realistic the graphical fidelity and level of detail is in Death Stranding, easily one of the best looking games I've played. After some time is spent running around and being introduced to the controls for obtaining and carrying carrying cargo, we arrive in a cave where we are formally introduced to our protagonist that we will take control of throughout the game, Sam Porter Bridges, voiced and motion captured by Norman Reedus. You better be ready for an attack from the smooch monster tonight. There you go. Kissy face emoji, kissy face emoji. Kissy face emoji. Sam is seeking shelter away from the rain and whatever it was that was chasing him, but before long, it catches on to where he's hiding, and it's here that we are formally introduced to the primary threat presented in the world of Death Stranding, known as BTs, or Beached Things. And then the character we hit with our bike before appears beside us in the cave and takes us aside as the impending threat of BTs is far from over. This part goes on for quite a while, but does a masterful job establishing the terrifying presence of a creature we know nothing about and can't even see. The camera tracks along each footstep slowly and methodically as the sound design hones in on these massive ear-crunching steps. Sometimes an unseen threat can be just as unsettling as one in plain sight. 
It reminds me a lot of Spielberg's masterful anticipation of the unseen, like that one scene in Jurassic Park where the characters cower in fear as the sounds of footsteps from a nearby T-Rex grow louder and louder with each step. We're also able to see the impeccable amount of detail set into the motion capture and animation rendering with what is nearly a one-to-one -one digital recreation of the actors portraying their characters, facial pores and all. We can even see the goosebumps form along Sam's arm when he detects he's in the presence of a BT. So many little technical details that enhance the sense of realism and that lend themselves to a cinematic quality that makes it feel as though you are watching a film with special care given to its craft and cinematography. Those aren't tears of joy, Sam and his new companion Fragile are crying for having survived this encounter, but rather tears stemming from what is referred to as a chiral allergy that sufferers of a unique condition called dooms are afflicted by. We'll get more into specifics on that later in the video, but for now, we just have to take it in stride. And I get it, falling in line with the notion of Kojima being Kojima. Death Stranding throws a lot at you and asks a lot of the player to have patience and trust that everything will work itself out despite the fact that you'll likely be thoroughly confused after just 10 minutes of having played the game. This isn't some new concept introduced by Kojima though, but rather a common trope of storytelling to overwhelm the viewer or reader or player with interesting concepts that make no sense in the context of our reality as we understand it. But the artistic intent behind this approach is to add to the mystery of what is taking place and compel the the player to want to continue and try to make sense of the unknown. Death Stranding, however, gets itself into a bit of trouble by way of leaving the player in the dark for the majority of its opening episodes, and then often overburdening the player in its downtime with extended sequences of exposition dumps that are often presented in a less than elegant fashion. We'll see some examples of that as we carry on. So our protagonist, Sam, is a freelance porter known far and wide for his unrelenting capacity to deliver orders consisting of vital supplies while passing through hazards that pose a significant risk to human life, for which not many are willing to put their lives on the line for. Fragile has interest in having Sam join her delivery company, Fragile Express, but Sam refuses on the grounds of wanting to be left alone to his work as a freelancer. She teleports away, and we are allowed to transition back into a gameplay section where we must head down to collect the rest of the cargo we dropped earlier on our way to delivering it to its end destination, Central Knot City. We get introduced to the remedial concepts of how to balance and wade through water or scale rocks without falling over and these rather simple tasks that would mean nothing in most other games become somewhat burdensome in Death Stranding. But this is the first Strand-type game in which it is equally difficult to carry out menial tasks as it is in reality, so I guess this makes sense. Upon making your first delivery to Central Knot City, Sam is alerted to a priority delivery for which he specifically has been assigned the disposal of a body at an incinerator, for reasons yet to be explained. And so now that we've gotten a small taste of what Death Stranding has to offer, we have to sit through a fairly lengthy bit of exposition in the back of this truck here regarding things Sam is already aware of that make no sense to be telling him about. So let's make more valuable use of this time to provide some exposition into topics and concepts that will be important to remember over the course of this video, and also lay out the general structure of the game so that we don't have to constantly stop and explain these things along the way. It's a lot of information to take in all at once, but I hope it might develop a sense of appreciation for the innovative and immense level of detail that went into crafting the intricate and interconnected world of Death Stranding, and it should serve as a relief of some confusion that may have come by way of going in blind if this was all new to you, or otherwise as a nice recap if it's been a while. 
Death Stranding takes place over three regions, each with their own isolated maps and each only accessible after reaching certain points in the game. The East region spans from the starting point of the game in Capital Knot City to the end point in Port Knot City with various other destinations to reach along the way. The Central region is where you'll spend the majority of your time in the game and where most of the major gameplay systems are set in motion. Lake Knot City, South Knot City, and Mountain Knot City are the primary destinations and hubs of interest in this region. But there there are many smaller way stations scattered throughout the region to visit as well. The western region is a remote area involving only one episode of the game and a single city by the name of Edgenot City, but it is what a majority of the story builds up toward reaching and is ultimately framed as your end goal in the game. Over the course of 14 episodes that form the main story and propel you along your journey through each of these regions, your primary task at hand is to bring several locations onto what is referred to as the Chiral Network. The Chiral Network is a type of interconnected connected network that allows its users to send data instantaneously and serves the multifaceted purpose of recovering data lost to time, allowing improved means of communication via chiralgrams, which are a form of hologram formed by a special type of matter that makes it seem as though someone far away is physically in the room with them. And it allows for the fabrication of tools and equipment through the use of chiral printers, which are able to construct a wide variety of devices. The chiral network does this by way of stemming from the beach. In the world of Death Stranding, the beach is a sort of metaphysical purgatory between the world of the living and the dead that individuals pass into upon death. And it is from here that the material Chirelium, believed to be a form of dark matter imperceivable to the human eye until the start of the Death Stranding, which I'll get to explaining what that even is shortly, originates from. Chirelium forms the backbone of the chiral network that Sam works to bring every major city in the game onto. Bringing way stations and the area surrounding them onto the chiral network affords the opportunity to create structures like bridges and roadways through the use of chiralium and chiral printers. Sam must use a device called a cupid, which is fitted with a large amount of chiralium and coated with necessary protocols to bring way stations onto the chiral network. Sam is carrying out this mission of establishing the chiral network in pursuit of his sister Amelie, who is being held captive by terrorists in Edgenot City to the west, and does it with the aid of a company named Bridges. Formed after the advent of the Death Stranding with the sole mission of rebuilding or bridging the gaps between the now remote surviving areas of the United States in order to form the United Cities of America. Since the Death Stranding reduced the US population down to nothing more than a scattered series of urban centers. Bridges end goal, and by extension Sam and the player's goal, is to bring every remaining city across the US onto the chiral network, so that everyone can live united as one yet again and come together during a time where unity and the connections between those remaining is more essential than ever. The primary threat Sam faces on his journey to reconnect America is against, first and foremost, the environment itself, as a byproduct of the rapid growth of chiralium in certain areas, which itself can cause negative effects on humans if they're exposed to large concentrations of it, there exists the constant threat of a weather phenomenon referred to as timefall. This is essentially precipitation that has taken the form of a deadly environmental hazard and rapidly accelerates the passage of time for anything that it touches, effectively imposing a heavy amount of damage and decomposition for anything that it comes into contact with. This is why those birds shriveled up and died in the rainstorm at the beginning of the game. This ties into the presence of the other primary obstacle Samus face along his journey, that being the BTs like those we saw earlier in the cave. But before getting into that topic, I wanted to preface it by explaining what it is we're attempting to do now with Igor in the back of this truck. Igor, as a member of a team of individuals responsible for the disposal of corpses, is tasked with transporting a body to an incinerator to be burned in a remote area where chirelium exposure does not pose a risk to human life. The other part of the reason behind why high levels of chirelium and timefall pose a threat to human life is due to the fact that these factors tend to manifest a high concentration of BTs. BTs are essentially beings that came into existence following the Death Stranding and are formed when a person fails to pass on to the intended world of the dead after making contact with the beach. As a result of the Death Stranding and in defiance of the nature of the universe and how it is intended to operate, those that die are now able to reconnect their soul to their body during a process referred to in the game as necrosis, after which point the person will transform 
transform into a BT if the body is not destroyed via cremation in a timely fashion. The primary risk to human life that BTs pose is their ability to trigger what is referred to as a void out, which is a massive explosion created when the antimatter of a BT makes contact with a living being, and this interaction leaves nothing but a crater in its wake. Sam is special in that he possesses abilities referred to as Dooms, and is also a repatriate. Dooms is a special condition affecting only a rare few individuals in the wake of the Death Stranding, affording them a stronger connection to the beach and the world of the dead, which aids in their ability to detect, see, and even control BTs in some cases, depending on the level of their Dooms affliction. However, it does come with the downside of plaguing those affected by it with constant apocalyptic nightmares that may trigger symptoms of mental illness giving way to a predisposition toward suicidal or even homicidal behavior. In having dooms, Sam is able to detect the presence of BTs, and if he is ever consumed by a BT triggering a void out, he can use his ability as a repatriate to essentially respawn or return from the beach at will by reconnecting his soul with his body. However, those without these abilities fare worse in an environment constantly haunted by these beings that roam what remains of America, and as a result, poor like Sam willing to journey out into the unknown for the sake of making vitally important deliveries to others are held on a special pedestal of high regard in society. The only safeguard against BTs that any average human being has is a BB unit or Bridge Baby, easily one of the strangest concepts introduced by the game and heavily teased in all of Death Stranding's promotional materials. BBs are essentially unborn fetuses separated from a brain-dead mother and preserved in a special pod that simulates the feeling of a still mother's womb, effectively tricking the fetus into believing it is still in the womb so that it can be used solely as a piece of hardware with the express purpose of using it to detect BTs. Their special connection to a catalyst split between the world of the living and the dead and a still mother whose brain is unresponsive allows them to detect the presence of BTs. Igor here is fitted with a BB unit as he realizes they will be passing through BT territory, and so by way of connecting with it he will be able to see and detect the presence of BTs should they run into any. And so finally, at the end of this long line of explanations, we get at the ultimate question. What is the Death Stranding of which this game is named after? The Death Stranding is the cataclysmic event that set everything as we see it presented in this game in motion. A connection between the world of the living and the dead that gives way to a series of unexplainable phenomena, ushering in an age of extinction for humanity. BTs, void outs, chiral matter, time fall, and all of these things tied to the world of this game stem from the occurrence of this event. The origins, impact, implications, and end result of the Death Stranding will naturally be explored over the course of this game, but for now, this level of detail should suffice. And so, with all that out of the way, we can pick up right where we left off in the middle of an exciting yet perplexing cutscene that helps establish many of the concepts we just covered. Everything else will come to light in due time. So, as we proceed toward the incinerator, the sky begins to darken as the crew becomes pummeled with time fall, and it is now increasingly obvious that Sam and friends have entered themselves into BT territory, of which they may not escape with their lives. The BTs eventually cause their truck to crash, and the cutscene to follow is one of the most viscerally terrifying, visually fascinating, and utterly confounding sequences I've ever experienced in any medium. I'd love to play it for you in its entirety, but it's quite lengthy, and I don't want to take away from your ability to experience it in full by playing the game yourself. So I'll just cut through some highlights here. They're here.
What can I say? How does one even respond to this? I don't even care that at this point in my first playthrough I had no idea what was going on. What was being presented and how it was being presented was so utterly fascinating and captivating that I was immediately hooked and in it for the long haul. Death Stranding does an exceptional job of reeling the player in with the intriguing promise of exploring a wealth of potential. And the saddest part of it is that nothing presented in the next few hours will come even close to this level of sheer mastery and excitement. The true test of endurance that Death Stranding sets forth is testing the limits of just how far the intrigue introduced by way of this prologue will carry you. <laughs> Following the void out triggered by this massive BT consuming Igor, Sam awakens on the beach next to a baby that he embraces. The baby turns into a BT that crawls towards the water as Sam stands to reveal the mark of him being a repatriate. And it's here, roughly a full hour into the game, that we finally get our title reveal. Oh no, we've walked too far and fallen into repatriation world. Yeah, so whenever Sam dies in Death Stranding, whether it's forced as part of the story like this or happens naturally as you're playing and make a mistake, you enter into the perspective of your soul trying to find its way back to reconnect with your body. It's visually stunning, like you're swimming around in some underwater purgatory of sorts. And along the way you can even scan for equipment and other players who died in the same location. And you can touch this equipment to recollect it or touch other players to connect with their souls. It's such an interesting and interactive means of respawning that adds that extra bit of value to edge out its uniqueness amongst so many games with a simple reload or retry button. And once you reconnect with your body, you are treated to this.
Now who is this mystery man we're receiving visions of? Well, more on that later. Now, we've awakened on the edge of a massive crater, and guess what? Your little endeavor to transport a corpse to the incinerator resulted in a massive void out, wiping the entirety of Central Knot City off the map, and taking the lives of thousands along with it. Yeah, that's just how much is at stake when it comes to just how great a risk to human life a single dead person can pose in the world of Death Stranding. Once there was an explosion. A bang which gave rise to life as we know it. And then came the next explosion. An explosion that will be our last. So Sam appears to be handcuffed to a bed in a place unfamiliar to him. An unknown man approaches claiming to be a doctor, and here we are introduced to the beautiful bastard himself, Dead Man, played by the ever so lovable Guillermo del Toro. Mm, kind of. Kojima and del Toro are longtime associates, and it's clear by way of the literal hours of time spent with the character credited as a supposed guest appearance, just how much Kojima adores his working relationship with del Toro, and how important it was to him to materialize del Toro into the world of Death Stranding in a way that was organic to the story. Sadly, much of his function in the game as a character gets reduced to contrived plot exposition and tutorial offerings, but I can't help but appreciate how endearing and genuine he is portrayed as a character here otherwise. But now we get into a little bit of trivia that honestly blindsided me and that I only just recently learned of in preparing this video and never once caught on to myself in playing the game several times. Much to my surprise, Dead Man and two other major characters in the game, portrayed by director Nicholas Winding Refn and actress Lindsay Wagner, were not, or at least not entirely, voiced or motion captured by the people primarily credited to them. It is almost uncanny how closely these voice actors manage to mimic the tone and cadence of the real-life individuals they are presenting. But in reality, these three well-known actors or directors are little more than model templates for characters that were then constructed around them using their voice or motion capture actors. It's certainly a bit odd learning this, as I honestly would never have noticed were it not pointed out to me specifically, but you'll notice that certain character introductions show credits for multiple actors, and the lower credit is actually that of the voice or motion capture actor behind the character. At the very least, Lindsay Wagner did in fact voice one of the characters she portrays in the game, but while her likeness is used for the other character she portrays, the voice is provided by someone else. Well done on Kojima's part for holding up the illusion so convincingly, and having such an amazing culmination of talent, able to bring these characters together in a truly seamless fashion. And so, returning to the story, Dead Man informs Sam that the handcuffs around his wrists aren't intended as a tool of imprisonment, but rather a communication system and means of connecting members of Bridges with the chiral network. Dead Man shares that they plan to dispose of the BB unit Igor was carrying because it failed to serve its intended function during your encounter with the BTs, and is ultimately to blame for the void out that claimed the whole of Central Knot City. Bridges is now headquartered out of Capital Knot City, the starting hub point of the game. Dead Man then takes notice of the handprint Fragile left on your arm when she grabbed you earlier in the cave, and this appears to stem from Sam's Affem... 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 Affem Fossumphobia. A condition that causes an intense fear of being touched both in the emotional and physical sense, fitting for the protagonist in a game all about forming emotional and physical connections. Dead Man then cuts to the chase about his reason for being there, which is to assign you an urgent delivery involving bringing morphine to the US President or the President of the United Cities of America, more fittingly nowadays. Sam questions why they want him of all people to make this delivery, to which Dead Man responds by sharing that the President has specifically requested he visit them. So we ascend from the room to start on our order of delivering morphine to the President.
After a light jog through the city, we arrive at the isolation ward to meet Dead Man in the dead flesh, and he shares with us that the president, now mere hours if not minutes away from death due to her ongoing battle with cancer, is none other than Sam's own mother. Immediately I'm thinking, how could Sam not know the president of the UCA in America is his own mother? It strains credibility a bit, but I guess it's plausible in the sense that Sam has been away from society and living in isolation in a version of America with no ability to disperse information on a large public scale. It stands to reason that Sam may have been living in ignorance of the fact that his mother is still the acting president all these years later, or that there even is still a president given the state of the world. So Sam gets all cleaned up and dressed in his fanciest attire to reunite with his dying mother and also Di Hardman, her right hand man and the director of Bridges. What's it been, Sam? Ten years? You talk with your mother, Bridget, who speaks of a woman you have yet to be introduced to named Amelie, who led the Bridges 1 expedition west years back, that first established the infrastructure for the chiral network that has since been largely disconnected outside of the major hubs. Bridget beckons Sam to continue on Amelie's mission to rebuild America by reconnecting the network, to which Sam reacts with a great amount of cynical bitterness, expressing his lack of any remaining hope for the America they once knew. Bridget then lunges at Sam because he won't won't listen to reason, and falls from her bed and crawls toward him, and then... <gasps> Madam President! Okay, but actually before that, we do get a quick cut of Bridget taking on the appearance of Amelie before saying the iconic line. I'll be waiting for you on the beach. Remember that line, because you'll be hearing it or listening to me talk over the subtitle of it about 50 times over the course of this video. So yeah, Sam's mother that you as the player just met about two minutes ago is now dead, and this really dramatic camera work and music swells up, seemingly trying to get the player to feel something, or at the very least feel the impact of the moment where the last president of America is dying. But obviously since this character was just introduced and we have no idea who they are, we don't really care. A necessary moment of narrative propulsion that is handled in the strangest way possible, and it admittedly makes me cringe a little bit every time I watch it. So now Die Hardman is tasked with covering up the death of America's president, and insists no one can know of her passing or the faith of a rebuilt America will quickly dissipate. Since Bridget's dying wish was for Sam to rebuild America, Die Hardman states rather matter-of-factly that this is what Sam must do, despite having no real motivation to do it himself. That motivation must then come from somewhere else. But before that, that, you must deliver the body of your dead mother to the closest incinerator before she necrotizes, and risks triggering another void out like the one you were just in that destroyed Central Knot. And so now, the journey begins. And so now the journey begins, and not even two minutes into our trip to the incinerator with Sam's dead mother on his back, Die Hardman is calling us to regurgitate the exact same information he just said in the cutscene two minutes ago. Sorry to say that Die Hardman, a character central to the narrative of Death Stranding, who we are supposed to be made to care for and sympathize with by the end of the game, is easily one of the most frustratingly mistreated and sidelined characters in the entire game. For the majority of the game, he will in inevitably come to annoy you like a little fly in your ear or the upset parent you know you'll have to face after you fail the test because you were too busy playing Death Stranding instead of studying. I'm going to try to hold my tongue on my annoyance with the ever-looming presence of Die Hardman butting into your ability to genuinely experience the game at multiple points for the sake of all the Die Hardman stands out there who disagree with my assessment of his treatment in the game. But we will get to addressing him and each of Death Stranding's quirky cast of characters as it becomes relevant to do so. Sam. Sam. Good work, Sam. I'll get you. And it looked like a bloody accident. And so here with Bridget's dead body, as you make your way toward the incinerator, you still haven't actually finished the opening of the game in the sense that you aren't yet connected to the online environment where you can interact, in a sense, with other players just yet. The open world of Death Stranding is still relatively closed off at this point. Now there's this beautiful moment where the lighting strikes just right and another godly low roar song comes on. And it's clear that there are these curated moments in gameplay where Kojima and friends were trying 
trying to make the gameplay like a carefully constructed cutscene. The environments and soundtrack in Death Stranding are certainly key highlights that make it easy to recommend, especially when paired alongside one another. However, as great as these curated moments Kojima likely would have rather had play out in a cutscene are, they rarely ever turn out as expected. For example, here you have all the elements coming together to construct this beautifully memorable little gameplay sequence, but then you realize that you're carrying your dead mother on your back and are still learning the controls of how to cross rivers with a dead body on your back, so you accidentally fall and drop your dead mother in the river and you have to reload your last save. And when you come back, the music is gone and the moment is ruined. There are a lot of sequences like this in the game where it's clear what Kojima intended to happen, but it's like the game is fighting itself between the experience it's aiming to provide and what the gameplay allows for. That risks ruining any sense of immersion that could be had in an actual gameplay sequence oftentimes. The music system was implemented in such a way that you'll sometimes hear barely even a sliver of a song before it gets interrupted by some other stupid audio cue or situation as if they were unable to anticipate that the music would be interrupted, despite introducing Producing it at points where they must have known that it would. Uh, well, okay, I was enjoying the first 10 seconds of that song, but okay. Nevertheless, I can't complain too much because either way, I'm entertained. <laughs> This is certainly quite an introductory mission that mostly involves getting fully acclimated to movement and balance controls when there's a lot on your back. After burning your mother's body, it releases Chirelium into the air around the incinerator, prompting the arrival of BTs, and your first terrifying introduction to the BTs in gameplay. Before the BTs arrive, you're instructed by Deadman to also destroy Igor's BB unit, BB-28, in the incinerator, given its faulty status. Sam disagrees with this decision, believing that it can still serve a purpose, and as BTs begin to close in on his location, he realizes that his BB may be his only chance for escaping the facility. He connects to the BB unit and experiences another brief vision of a mysterious man before it finally enters into its intended function that it failed to fulfill during its time with Igor. Now we're tasked with plotting a route back to Capital Not City that hopefully doesn't result in a void out, and the first time I played the game, I got my shit rocked here because I was so panicked that I just rushed through the middle. This time I was able to sneak past with relative ease and without being detected. At least in the early game though, the tension remained throughout and these early sequences with the BTs will always stand out as memorable to me. The consequences of being detected and captured by them are so dire, especially if you're carrying cargo, that you will do everything in your power to avoid it. Sadly though, my alternative path didn't entirely work out as intended as I ended up having to scale along the cliffside of the river which did not turn out as I had hoped. <laughs> Hello, how are you? I am under the water. Please help me. You're too much raining. After escaping the BTs, we make our way back to Capital Knot, and we are finally treated to a genuinely great musical moment that isn't ruined by your dead mother.
Once you return to Capital Knot, Deadman shares that Doom sufferers are naturally incompatible with BB units in terms of connection due to the way that it may amplify the negative aspects of the condition in being more in touch with the other side. He reiterates that the BB must still be disposed of, but Sam has now developed an emotional connection with the flawed BB unit that rescued him from certain death. When confronted by Dead Man back in the Distro Center, Sam stands in strong defense of keeping his BB unit intact before descending into his private room. He then falls asleep and enters into one of many flashbacks of his time on the beach with Amelie. Amelie fits him with a dream catcher that forms his connection to her and it's here that we begin Amelie's episode. Wear it when you sleep and I'll keep the nightmares away. I'll always be with you. Once you awaken, you're able to interact with a private room for the first time. Private rooms serve as a hub point in the game where you are able to regain your energy, plan your next steps, and interact with all the equipment and memorabilia you've gathered so far. You can review emails, logs, and the areas you've connected to the network so far. You can play music, of which you've discovered and unlocked by playing through certain areas. You can check in on BB or check your nose hairs in the mirror. There's even opportunities presented to replay certain parts of the game after you've completed them. The highlight here is of course being able to select between three choices of peeing, pooping, or showering in your multi-purpose bath unit which then produces special grenades created from your urine or fecal matter that you can then use as a weapon against enemies. Yeah, they take the concept of Sam's bodily fluids having special properties that expose weaknesses against BTs to the absolute extreme. And it's a wonderful and welcome quirk for enjoyment in the game. After cleaning up, we return to the fake Oval Office so that Di Hardman can lecture us about American Reconstructionism again before he presents us the picture of shining bliss and beauty herself and the catalyst of our hope for a better future. Our new America. Homily. My mother may be gone, but I'm here. And you, Sam, you're here too. Amelie is Sam's adoptive sister and never changes appearance or ages over time because her body is still on the beach, as she puts it. Die Hardman wants to name Amelie as the succeeding president and their mission to rebuild the UCA with Sam as their point man begins to take form. Sam is still understandably hesitant. They then break out this really cool video gamey recap of the Bridges 1 expedition Amelie led in first establishing the chiral network years back. Their expedition was stopped just short of bringing the final city, Edge Knot City, into the fold when the entire unit was wiped out and Amelie was taken captive by the Homo Demons, a militant separatist group passionate in their mission to ensure the UCA is never able to rebuild America or the Chiral Network, and they are led by a man named Higgs, the man with the golden mask. This effectively translates to Amelie not being physically present in the room as she is being allowed to project herself there via Chirilgram. Her captors have surprisingly given her a semblance of freedom in her captivity. The homo demons are so invested in their common goal that they will carry out actions in support of it no matter the cost. And it is alleged that the void out that claimed Central Knot City may have actually been a coordinated attack in knowing that the corpse would likely trigger a void out. Sam continues expressing strong resistance against the idea of being Bridges' puppet and being forced into rebuilding a country he no longer cares about. He leaves the room ultimately unconvinced. Deadman and Die Hardman then beckon with him to get some rest and reconsider before making a final decision, and Deadman gives the BB back to Sam, now repaired and recalibrated into working order. A 
Upon resting, Sam experiences another dream on the beach, and it is here in the deep recesses of his subconscious that Sam is finally convinced that he will carry out on the mission that has been requested of him. Not for Bridges or America, but for Amelie. The end goal of reaching Edgenot City would be to free his sister from captivity with rebuilding the chiral network along the way, merely being a secondary condition. Die Hardman enters the room and rather insistently assumes Sam to be on board with the situation, and so our journey begins again, but for real this time. Anyway, all you've got to do is find the knot, connect your cupid, and bring chiral communications online. Once you connect it to the terminal, you'll be able to initiate zero-time massive data transmission with the UCA network. And just like that, you'll reconnect us not only to each other, but to our past. All the lost and fragmented junk data will be compiled and restored, like bringing a dinosaur back to life from a fossil. Four point six billion years of history on Earth. All the wisdom and knowledge we lost since the Death Stranding will be ours again. And that, my friend, is how we'll beat this thing. And man, Sam must really love Amelie because he is really put through the ringer in just about every terrible situation possible over the next several hours of the game on his way to Amelie. Never underestimate the power of a connection, I guess. During his ascension from the private room, we're treated to yet another vision of a mysterious man, presumably a father figure buried in the memories of the BB unit, that are channeling into Sam's mind every time he connects with it. From here on out, exiting a private room will pretty consistently trigger a cutscene that attempts to piece together a subplot deeply inherent to the story of Death Stranding that will not entirely make sense until the very end. Just another reason to carry on. I'll take care of him. I promise you. And so that marks the end of what I would consider to be the prologue or opening chapters of the game that get you acclimated to the story, gameplay elements, and all the major things that you can expect from this game. The next chunk of the game is mostly focused around introducing you to the core gameplay loop and the open world of Death Stranding. You have to connect the Cupid to a way station, distro center, and wind farm on your way to Port Knot City while carrying deliveries of requested supplies to each destination. It's this stretch of the game that will ultimately determine whether or not it is for you. Once you reach Port Knot City and trigger a major cutscene there, if you aren't entirely hooked after that, you likely never will be. The game mostly breaks down to what is presented during this segment of it. You connect destinations along a set path, but the way you go about reaching them and the amount of time you spend in each region is entirely dependent on how involved you want to get on developing your connections in that region. Every way station has a connection level which can be strengthened by completing both deliveries specifically intended for Sam and also more routine deliveries that a way station would simply like any porter to complete. Oftentimes you only have to complete a single primary delivery to the next destination along the path to bring it online to the chiral network. However, if you want to bolster your connection level even better at the next destination, it's good to accept as many orders directed there as possible concurrently. 
Sometimes you'll reach a destination and the delivery they want you to complete involves backtracking a delivery to a destination you already brought online. Yeah, there's a lot of forced backtracking in this game. For example, once you reach the distro center before reaching Port Knot, you must go all the way back to Capital Knot where you started the game to obtain vital supplies for Port Knot before you can bring Portnot onto the network and continue the main story. This exact thing occurs in the next region as well. Now normally I would find this to be grading and unnecessary padding, however there are a couple solid reasons that this doesn't end up bothering me in Death Stranding. These reasons mostly revolve around the fact that Death Stranding does a good job establishing reasons and motivations behind what you are doing, even though it doesn't offer much in the way of story. Although on paper, yes you are just fumbling your way back along rolling hills and mountains with an unrealistically large pile of cargo on your back to make deliveries, it's the impact and gratification of completing those orders feeding into a constant feedback loop that, at least for my OCD ape brain, makes the journey rewarding. Backtracking all the way to Capital Knot City, for example, is alleviated by the fact that you can use your reverse trike, which you obtain at the distribution center, all the way there and back, making for a much faster journey in contrast to the long haul that took you there on foot. You come to appreciate the progress you've made in being able to go back along the same path with relative ease. And on top of that, it allows you to take in all that you've done so far in a moment of reflection and appreciate how the region has developed and how far you've developed as a player over the course of the however many hours you were in that region before proceeding on to the next. The game also establishes logical reasons for having to do this, such as establishing that Port Knot City is currently in dire straits and in desperate need of these surplus supplies from Capital Knot in order to prevent any fatal losses or shortages. As previously mentioned, there's a constant feedback loop of making these deliveries where you're always provided with information on what you're delivering and the positive impact it will have in making it. You'll often hear from people you've delivered to after the fact via the in-game mail system, which is a really comforting and appreciated means of recognition. You'll also bolster your connection level in doing so, and by raising your connection level, you also unlock access to more equipment, resources, and lore by way of interview and logs. Certain locations allow unlocks for certain equipment, so so for example, if you want to obtain schematics to be able to fabricate a level 3 speed skeleton that allows you to move very quickly for a prolonged period of time, you'll need to make enough deliveries to earn a 4 star connection or better at that specific terminal. Additionally, the more deliveries you complete and the more efficiently you perform in these deliveries, the more you will level along various ends of the game's progression system which takes the form of a star chart. There are 5 ends of the star chart which can be developed by each delivery depending on the details, and as you make more deliveries, you will earn more respect across the entire UCA by raising your overall porter level, and people will refer to you in an increasingly positive and envious manner as you level further. Your porter level is essentially your level as it would be traditionally referred to in any other game, and once you become more well known, people will react with great excitement in meeting you and will be overjoyed to have you add them to the network. You'll also unlock abilities by leveling that make future deliveries easier, such as how leveling delivery volume raises your max carry capacity. Capacity. In lieu of traditional experience points, you'll earn likes for many actions you carry out in the game, driving through other players' signs, building structures that are used by others, completing deliveries, and even just watching cutscenes can earn you likes that contribute toward your overall popularity and reputation as a porter. I can't say I entirely understand the appeal or need for this in the context of the game, and at times it can be a bit grating and take you out of the experience, but it certainly is different and is a nice way of incorporating what feels like an integrated in-game social network when paired with other things like the mail system that connects you to the rest of the world without having to constantly interface with them in person. What really pulls the core gameplay loop together for me and makes it all the more satisfying is your ability to create structures and how that goes hand in hand with the online aspect of the gameplay. One thing I haven't touched on yet is how Death Stranding's implementation of multiplayer or online functionality is one of the most unique I've seen. When you bring a destination onto the chiral network, it will now have online capabilities, not just in terms of the game world itself and its connection to the in-game chiral network, but also in terms of real-world online features and connecting you to the game's online network. This translates to many different layers of gameplay impressions that other players also moving through your region and their respective playthroughs can have on your game. Other players can leave signs that warn you of a threat ahead and allow you to plan accordingly. They can leave signs that boost your morale and encourage you to continue, you can see the exact paths that other players have taken, 
and in a tight pinch they can even phase into your game and offer you supplies. I still don't know quite how this feature works, but during particularly challenging situations, the projection of another player may appear and offer to throw you vital supplies that may make the difference between life and death. And as mentioned prior, other players can assist with the building of structures. You can place and construct ladders, bridges, climbing ropes, and other things that make it easier to traverse rough terrain. If a player plays something in their game and it's running concurrently with your playthrough, that same structure will appear in your game to assist you. I often didn't have to create my own structures due to this feature allowing me to save on resources, but it wasn't overdone to the point where it was too easy or I was overloaded with structures placed on every corner of the map in a distracting or obnoxious way. Somehow the game manages to find a perfect balance with the number of structures it allows to appear in a given area, and even still as you progress into a new area outside the chiral network, you will have to traverse on your own and create your own structures. But when you backtrack back through that same area after connecting the region to the chiral network, you will have access to this online assistance like this once again, making any return trips that much easier. I love this element of the gameplay. It offers the bleak, hopeless nature of Death Stranding's world that subtle silver lining of reassurance without ruining your sense of difficulty or immersion. It makes it feel like a truly collaborative, community-based effort to bring the world back together again. I actually did a separate playthrough with online features intentionally disabled and found myself sorely missing out on a core part of the game. The difference between having and not having online capability with this game is night and day, and I think I'd have a harder time recommending it if this feature didn't exist. It's just so wonderful wonderful and unique and rewarding to be a part of this online connected network that fits in perfectly and serves as a clever thematic parallel to the game's own chiral network and these ideas of unity and collaboration. You're literally working with other players and people in real life to rebuild America from the brink of extinction, and in your darkest moments, it's these online connections that can bring you to want to carry on and see things through. And this means of online interaction doesn't carry with it the kind of toxicity and hostility that other mainstream forms of online games gameplay typically carry with them. Though there was one instance where an online player tricked me by placing a sign that I could see on my map, indicating a path to be easily traversable by vehicle, only to find it covered in rocks that made it nearly impossible to do so before I was ambushed by BTs. So that was a fucking lie. And one great thing I didn't mention is that you can actually contribute materials to the creation of structures that were started by other players, further enhancing the aspect of teamwork and collaborative gameplay without ever actually playing alongside another person. Large structures like roads and bridges require a certain amount of materials to build, including things like metals, resins, and ceramics, which can be collected along your travels, often strewn across the landscape or being stored in certain locations. You can also claim materials from the reserves at certain locations connected to the network and carry them to the structure to finish its construction. You can even form the foundation of a structure and request the contribution of materials from other players, and may find yourself returning to that structure later in the game, now completely built, thanks to the contributions of others. It's a brilliant system. I normally hate this construction sim aspect of games, but it isn't too complicated, and knowing that it contributes to the wellness of others while also having it improve my own ease of progression makes it exceptionally rewarding. Further on the end of other online features, you also have the ability to complete deliveries that others left behind, or have other players complete your excess or non-mission based deliveries for you. If you don't think you can get a piece of cargo onto its intended destination, you can entrust it with other online porters who may be headed there in their playthroughs, so it ultimately ends up reaching its destination regardless. Alternatively, if you're headed somewhere, you can check the terminal at your current way station to see if any outstanding cargo from other players is being stored there for which you can claim and carry on to its intended destination. You'll gain likes and boost your bridge level for doing so. The best part of all this online connectivity is that it is seamless. If you lose connection, the game isn't just going to stop playing or stop to search for servers or any typical live service BS, and you can pause the game like any other single player game at any time, or even reload saves if something didn't quite turn out as you had hoped, which is bound to happen quite often. 
One other thing I love about the core gameplay loop in Death Stranding introduced in this region is the ability to plot routes. You can be as strategic or unstrategic as you want in planning your path to the next destination. You can drive your vehicle or run along a straight path directly to your destination, or you can look at signs and routes plotted by other players to determine the best and safest paths. It's often best to avoid areas with known stretches of timefall, which will be indicated on the map by online signs. You can see what other players have placed ladders, bridges, and other structures for use that aid your means of reaching your destination. And it's actually pretty involved as to the level of interaction you can have in planning your routes to minimize risk and maximize efficiency so that you don't damage or lose any cargo. But with the mention of vehicles, we'll now get into some negative aspects of the gameplay loop introduced in this region as well. These revolve around what I mentioned before, such as how there's very little narrative progression here, outside of a couple cutscenes that establish the supposed urgency of reaching Amelie, despite creating every diversion imaginable to distract you from that goal, and also go over the origins and facilities of BB units. But this entire region lacks in terms of anything that would hook you in relation to the story with any grand cutscenes at the level of the first three hours. That's why I mentioned that if you don't find yourself interested in playing further after reaching Port Knot City, I think it'd be safe to conclude the game just might not be for you. Because Death Stranding operates in this way throughout, with large swaths of progressing along waypoints through a region, but narrative progression is often few and far between, locked behind you reaching certain destinations or completing certain deliveries. It's very rare that an unexpected narrative event transpires by way of your progress between destinations. The other two gripes with gameplay that I wanted to focus on in this region are, as mentioned, vehicles and BTs. So let's start with BTs. Often when traveling between destinations, you will encounter timefall, inevitably. If you proceed deep into a timefall area, you will likely encounter BTs. It's my understanding that in this first region between Capital Knot and Port Knot, the BTs are set in specific scripted locations, where the developers know it will serve as a significant point of difficulty to establish the danger of BTs interactions. Later in the game, you can actually use a weather station to track timefall patterns which move dynamically as time passes. You can actually sneak your way through every BT encounter using stealth by following your BB unit's warnings and moving strategically, but chances are high you will come upon a BT encounter unexpectedly or when you are just on the cusp of reaching a destination and want to rush your way over to it. Patience is key with BTs, but if you don't have that or if you happen to be using a vehicle, you're going to find yourself in a world of pain. If you're caught by a BT, you'll be transported into an encounter where you are surrounded by a pit of tar while other BTs clamor at your feet, attempting to drag you down into it. If the BTs manage to capture you, you'll be carried to an encounter with a catcher BT, which holds with it a collection of antimatter from the world of the dead. And if this makes contact with Sam, it will trigger a void out. These catchers serve as mini-bosses in the game and will attempt to consume Sam. You must either destroy the catcher with weapons made of your blood or bodily fluids or escape outside its area of effect. If it manages to consume you, you will die and be able to repatriate, but that entire portion of the map will be voided out and inaccessible. This is an amazingly awesome feature of the game that it lets you fail but has significant consequences on the world for doing so, which may effectively halt your progress. Why I mention this whole angle as a negative is because I have a love-hate relationship with it and it actually ties in directly with my complaints about vehicles. As is known by anyone who's ever played the game, the vehicles in Death Stranding are terrible. I would have thought the first priority of address in releasing a director's cut would have been fixing these glaring technical abominations, but apparently not as they have hardly improved at all in terms of functionality since initial release. They are so unbelievably broken, and you'll have to tell me if playing on controller gives you a similar experience. They will boost and unboost on their own constantly, the menu will close itself if you open it while driving and then reopen itself after a closing, the vehicles catch on every piece of terrain no matter the size and the physics are so inconsistent they might as well be non-existent. This is an unforgivably bad aspect of the game that, when compounded with BT encounters, holds the potential to become the most frustrating aspect of gameplay you will encounter. To be fair, there's never a part of the game where you are required to use vehicles, however given the exceptional boost in carry capacity and speed that they provide, and how much time they allow you to save in 
in reaching a destination, you will often find yourself going out of your way to try using a vehicle to reach every destination after you finally unlock them, because it will afford you the ability to complete significantly more deliveries per run. Inevitably, you will run into a BT area in a vehicle, and your naive self will think, oh, no worries, I can just boost my way through this easily. Well, welcome to the unexplainable Death Stranding phenomenon that is colliding with every pebble on the ground, combined with the BT's ability to just stop your vehicle on a dime. You'll be moving along, hit a rock, and then get frozen by the grasp of the BTs. Then your vehicle is unusable and you have to get off or out of it, and if the BTs pull you down to spawn in a catcher, your cargo will be strewn all around the vehicle, now heavily damaged. And assuming you're able to escape the encounter without triggering a void out, you'll have to go back and pick up every single piece of cargo, and reconfigure it in the cargo menu to be on the vehicle and your back just as it was before. These BT encounters are equal parts brilliant and incessantly frustrating, because on the one hand it ensures that even in a vehicle you never have the assurance of guaranteed safety, and it offers a nice bit of gameplay diversity into the mix. But on the other hand it becomes very frustrating when you're within a couple hundred meters of your destination and then you get swallowed into a BT encounter that heavily damages or destroys your cargo you just spent 30 minutes carrying along to its destination. Of course you can always reload the save thankfully, but the same thing just might happen again because vehicles are consistently unreliable when you're not driving along a road. It's honestly enough to just want to stop playing at times if you aren't fully committed, but it does add another layer of gratification in finally reaching your destination when you finally do, in a sort of sadistic Dark Souls type way. But again, it wouldn't be as frustrating if the vehicles handled properly. They're woefully unpredictable and even perfect planning and execution can be interrupted by technical hiccups that shouldn't exist, thereby ruining the sense of immersion and fairness in the difficulty balance. The last gameplay systems I wanted to touch on here in this region is inventory management and controls. Starting with controls, I feel like there's just too many things bound to each button. I'm using an Xbox controller and the left and right triggers are used for balance, so you'll constantly be pressing them to shift weight in either direction or hold steady like Tony Hawk trying to hold a sick grind. But then equipment like guns, grenades, and container spray are also aimed with the left trigger and used with the right, so good luck trying to throw a grenade instead of shifting or holding your cargo weight or vice versa. And equipment will constantly refuse to be put away even when I press the hotkey to do so, or will cycle in and out of active use when I'm trying to use it, resulting in me throwing a grenade when I'm just trying to gain my balance, or shifting my weight when I really just wanted to throw a grenade. Oh, and on top of that, the left and right triggers are also used to pick up cargo in your left and right hands, so you might be running along shifting weight and then accidentally pick up a piece of cargo that makes you topple over because now your weight balance is off. You also might be intentionally carrying cargo in your hands and accidentally press the wrong button and just chuck that cargo like a loaded gun and break it. Or you might get off your trike and try to balance the weight on your back and accidentally take the cargo off the trike, which the left and right triggers also do. I can't tell you how many times I had to watch this stupid animation play of me taking cargo off and putting it on the bike when I was just trying to balance all the cargo on my back after dismounting. And it seems like the controls get exceptionally out of whack when you're on or just after dismounting a vehicle. As mentioned prior, menus will cycle in and out and sometimes things would occur after I dismount without me even pressing the button for it, as if the keys got remapped for a few brief seconds or the game is playing itself. Oh and if you're carrying a lot on your back then things get really messed up. Your entire center of gravity gets out of alignment if you carry too much, which makes sense in terms of physics but can often lead to some pretty frustrating scenarios. Like this time I was trying to retrieve cargo flowing through a river with a bunch of cargo on my back. Sam is so hard to stop if he's carrying a lot and takes a long time to react to controls. Also the movement becomes very imprecise so you'll end up doing things you don't want to and you need to be within a foot of cargo to pick it up so you'll be trying to spin around to grab it only for Sam to zoom forward in the opposite direction and plummet into the water so all your cargo can float away. This, paired with the vehicle jank, are two of the most widely criticized aspects of the gameplay, and for good reason in my opinion. These elements of the game check out in a general sense in service of realism, but their technical execution is often so disorienting and occasionally just straight up broken that it breaks the boundary between challenging and frustrating. And I still can't figure out if this was intentional as some sort of cruel joke or thematic extension, or if these aspects of the game just genuinely couldn't be refined correctly. But again, you'll have to tell me 
if you experience some of these technical quirks while playing on controller. I even tried it on three different controllers and two different adapters and got unique glitches in the controls for each. And you're often having to toggle and hold so many buttons simultaneously that I can't imagine not playing the game on controller. Not to mention the fact that it was designed to be a console game originally, so it was certainly puzzling to see it so poorly optimized in that regard. And finally we get to the inventory management system. It's a really neat system with a sleek UI that's pretty nice when you get used to it, but it's also so heavily layered and involved that there are aspects of it that you might entirely miss out on for a good deal of time, or otherwise find tedious in having to redo it constantly. You have your backpack, which is where you carry the majority of your cargo, however you want to avoid carrying as much as possible directly on your back. And so to offset this, you have these holsters on your shoulders and hips that can carry smaller pieces of equipment or cargo to offset the cargo on your back. There's also a utility pouch where you can place blood bags for health regeneration, and a tool rack where you can hang small pieces of cargo or typically a weapon of some sort to make it easy to whip out. And you can hang two extra pairs of boots on your boot clips since those are capable of being destroyed as well. And failing all that, you can assign any excess cargo be placed on or in your vehicle or carry them in your hands. If it sounds like there's a lot going on here, it's because there is. You have to spend a fair amount of time getting acclimated to this inventory management system to get the full benefit of it. But spending all this time pausing the game to interact with the system is not necessarily something most players are going to enjoy doing. However, once you do get the hang of it, you'll become appreciative of just how much customization it allows. Where it begins to falter is just how often you end up having to use it to rearrange things that you already spent so much time Time arranging in the first place. It's like having to clean up a house that has an endless stream of dust coming in through the windows. For example, if you have a gun on your tool rack but decide to use a different piece of equipment that isn't on the tool rack, it will swap that equipment onto your tool rack and place the gun onto your back, which typically takes up a full vertical slab of space and can throw you entirely off balance. So every time you use equipment, you're having to reassign it back to the place you wanted it to be. Then there's the fact that every time equipment falls off your back or a part of your body or gets thrown off or out of your vehicle, you'll have to pick it back up and then rearrange it back to how it was in the cargo menu. And when you pick up new orders, you'll likely end up shifting things around to make space for it as well. You'll constantly be in this menu rearranging things for a system that seems to favor realism and immersion over convenience and efficiency, with very little in the way of progression that makes it easier to do this over the course of the game. And this might be appealing to some, but to me it just got to be rather tedious after a while. And so with all of those major gameplay systems introduced in this region out of the way, we can finally put the first chunk of the game behind us and move on to the next big section, which involves bringing Port Knot City onto the Chiral Network. After we reach the Distro Center west of Capital Knot, you must return to Capital Knot City to carry vital supplies onto Port Knot City as mentioned earlier. Reaching Port Knot City is a major checkpoint in the game, and as I mentioned earlier, if you aren't at all invested by that point of bringing Port Knot City onto the network, I personally can't see there being much reason for you to continue. I mean, give it another 10 minutes for the epic confrontation that comes after, but following that point I'd say you gave it a fair shake, and if it isn't for you, then it isn't for you. At the very least, I hope that anyone watching this might be convinced enough to at least give the game a try, despite some of the shortcomings I've mentioned so far, because it is really worth it in the end. I realize I'm saying this after spending the last few minutes dogpiling it for the many things it got wrong, and as much as I'd like this to be a constant stream of endorsement and positivity, I don't want to shy away from acknowledging the very very real and tangible criticisms that I and many others had with the game and that I hope can be improved in a potential sequel. And I find it to be a powerful testament as to the quality of the game overall that these rather glaring issues that would normally drag things down in most other games do not heavily detract from the overall experience to a point that makes it just straight up not worth playing. If anything, these criticisms are minor roadblocks along what has been an otherwise exceptional singular journey for me. I only took the time to construct this hours long video because I am so passionately invested in it after multiple playthroughs. There are experiences I shared in playing Death Stranding that can be almost exclusively attributed to the journey of playing this game. Kojima set out to provide something different, and whether that's a good or bad form of different is certainly up for debate, but regardless, I find 
find it to be a breath of fresh air that I will never forget and want to encourage others to try. It isn't different just for the sake of standing out or just being weird, but rather stands on its own merits in the context of the world it strives to construct so very meticulously. I feel the majority of the videos that came out around the time of release for Death Stranding just buried and discredited it by framing all of this weirdness out of context and by only highlighting its less than fulfilling elements. But I don't think these are the elements that should ultimately define the game. In fact, if anything, I find most of these quirks to be endearing enhancements to the overall experience. I had also spent a good deal of time on the same bandwagon as most people, thinking, oh, that game where you deliver packages and characters drop quirky one-liners and you can fall down a hill and drop your dead mother? No thanks, not for me, I don't need to put any time into that. But I find it incredibly reductive that the most common response you see on social media to any mention of Death Stranding is that it's quote-unquote nothing more than a FedEx delivery game or a glorified walking sim. To dismiss something with such a clear and visible level of effort and vision just because you didn't enjoy playing it, or worse yet, just hopping on the same bandwagon to carry on this negative stigma without ever actually having played the game, is entirely unfair to a project that aspires to offer so much more than most modern mainstream gaming experiences, which are already steering away from single player offerings like Death Stranding. There are likely thousands of people out there in the world where all they'll ever know of Death Stranding is the memes and joke videos that came out of it, and to me that is just a disservice to this monumental achievement in cinematic world building that Kojima and friends have constructed. There is so much substance and attention to detail and enjoyment to be had with this game that offers something richly definitive in its own unique way. Even if all I ever got out of playing Death Stranding were the first three hours with its beautifully animated opening cutscenes, and I ultimately couldn't commit to playing the rest of the game, I could at least walk away saying that this is a landmark technical achievement that I'm glad to have witnessed. And and I hope that in making this video, we can all at least agree that even if you don't personally like the game after having tried it, there's still at the very least an admirable level of effort and quality on display here in one or multiple aspects. This was not some factory made rinse and repeat soulless product spit out to turn over a quick profit. There isn't even so much as a single microtransaction or monetization scheme in this game. You may not like Death Stranding on a personal level, but there's no denying that it takes certain risks and offers the kind of custom tailored single-player experience that more mainstream titles ought to aspire toward nowadays. Now up to this point in the video I've carefully avoided major story spoilers. And this is the point where that all changes, as I mentioned earlier on in the video. The first area of the game is mostly just setting things in motion and reveals very little as to answers that might unravel the several mystery boxes at the core of the story here. It throws a lot at you and trusts you to have the care and patience to want to see things through while slowly drip feeding you the answers in a carefully constructed but rather convoluted manner. But I will say that every question I had developed in the first few hours of gameplay was eventually answered by the end, and in a way that felt like it it had satisfying closure on everything that preceded it. If you do stick with playing this game all the way through, I vehemently believe it will be a worthwhile experience. If you still aren't convinced, just give it a try when it goes on sale and make your way to Port Knot City, by which time you'll know if it's your type of game. And I guarantee you will have gotten at least something worthwhile out of it by then, even if it ends up not being to your liking. Death Stranding is very much a you'll either love it or hate it type of game, so if you're still not convinced and don't want to spend the money just yet, well, feel free to carry on with me here as we continue to explore how the rest of Death Stranding unravels and break down everything that makes it great, intermixed with some relatively minor things that hold it back. The rest of this video will serve more as a recap of the major story beats and gameplay elements in the hopes of furthering the narrative on the significance of this game and all that went into it, and why I feel it deserves a shifting in public perception. I'll be covering things in chronological order, but I won't be covering literally every aspect of the game from here on out. So so just know there are likely some minor elements I may gloss over. For example, there may be some structures or pieces of equipment or technology I didn't really take advantage of in my playthroughs and therefore felt them to be impertinent to cover in this video. All of this being in the interest of this video not running as long as it takes to beat the game itself. So just be forewarned that everything from here on out will contain major spoilers for Death Stranding. No more holding back.
I may at times jump forward to later parts in the game to contextualize or provide examples in relation to a specific event or happening in the game. If you just want to continue on this journey with me despite not having played the game before, I thank you and I hope I'm able to convey the fact that even after watching this video, Death Stranding is still very much worth picking up and trying yourself at one point or another regardless. If you have played Death Stranding and love it as much as I do, Thanks for watching up to this point. I really appreciate it, and I hope the rest of this video might touch on topics or points of discussion that fall outside what you might already know or be aware of, or that it might at least rekindle your appreciation of the game as well. There's just so much packed into Death Stranding that every individual's experience with it is likely to differ in significant ways, and you may experience things I never did, or vice versa, thereby enhancing its face value and replayability and making discussion of this game all the more interesting. And so with all of that behind us, let's get into the rest of Death Stranding.